Alicia Wall, Melissa McLean, and Stephanie Dowie from the Academics from the Academic Success Center. Memorial's Academic Success, Success Center is a new initiative that serves an online hub to students to connect with support where they need, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm using two different computers here. Uh, the ASE, Academic Student Success, Success Center, is a new initiative that serves as an online hub to help students connect with the support they need to succeed in their learning. The ASC offers programming and resources that promote the development of effective learning strategies and study skills. The presentation will focus on the learner-centered work being done by the Academic Su Success Center to contribute to student success at Memorial. In a discussion of the AS ASC's first operational semester, this session will demonstrate how the ASC has evolved to help equip students with the skills they need to become confident and resilient learners. So I'd now like to turn it over to the presenters. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Alicia Wall, I'm the Academic Success Coordinator um, at the, the Academic Success Center. Um, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Stephanie and Melissa, who I'll um, invite to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Melissa McLean and I am the Learner Success Specialist here at the ASC. And my name is Stephanie Dowie. I'm the Supplemental Instruction Specialist. Great. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how we've developed the Academic Success Center, or the ASC, um, as we'll be referring to it, um, to promote learner development, creating those uh, resilient and unstoppable learners to contribute to student success at Memorial. Uh, so as an overview of the session this morning, uh, since we are relatively new, we'll start with an introduction to what the ASC is, followed by an overview of the services that we provide. Um, then Melissa will focus in on our learner success programming and how we have been building relationships with students um, and facilitating those engaging and learner-driven sessions in the last semester. Um, and finally, as we are still growing, we'll touch on our plans for the future um, and talk a little bit about what we have coming up with a particular spotlight um, on the peer assisted learning program, which we're happy to launch this spring, uh, which Stephanie will tell us about a little bit later. Uh, so what is the Academic Success Center? Uh, so the ASC is a hub for learning supports programs and tools that help students learn to succeed um, in university. We are currently located online um, on our website at mun.ca slash ASC. Um, which is part of the MUNOP site that was established during the pandemic response as that virtual hub for students to connect with campus while we were all remote. So from that beginning as sort of that navigational hub that connected students with existing academic related services offered by the various departments and units um, across the institution, um, the ASC has grown with the hiring of staff uh, now to provide our own services that will add to and complement the landscape of uh, the many student focuses supports that we have. Um, and as we know, that landscape is made up of many excellent services available to students across our campuses. Um, but there was sort of a gap in centralized learning services on the St. John's campus um, through, though there were some academic skills workshops and resources that were offered by various units, perhaps um, adjacent to the primary focus or targeted within particular faculties or disciplines. Um, so the ASC aims to fill that gap by offering those dedicated learning skills resources and programs, um, in addition to collaborating and promoting the academic services of partners across campus to help students connect with the supports they need um, when they need it. Oops, sorry, I advanced too quickly. Uh, so as I mentioned with our team of three, um, we're able to offer our own services um, with Melissa, our learner success specialist, uh, creating and facilitating programs and resources to promote learner development. Um, and Stephanie, our supplemental instruction specialist to facilitate our peer assisted learning program using the well-known and established supplemental instruction model. Um, and we'll hear more about both of those later and how they add to Memorial's uh, student success initiatives. So with that in mind, I wanted to highlight uh, some of the overarching goals and aims of the Academic Success Center, um, which inform and guide the programs and supports that we offer. So these include the promotion of academic skill development to help students gain and enhance the learning skills that they need to succeed, both inside the classroom and beyond. 
Um, and in this learner success area, we focus on strategies and skills to help students kind of learn how to learn um, and develop positive habits and effective time management that will carry them through uh, their degree. So those uh, kinds of skills encourage students to become uh, strategic learners who are confident in their abilities, resilient in the face of academic challenges or setbacks, and engaged in their learning. So this contributes to the development of metacognitive skills that allow students to become self-regulated um, in their learning by setting goals, creating plans, um, and evaluating and reflecting on their learning process so that they can adjust and readjust as needed as they progress through their program. So we facilitate the development of those skills through our offerings of student-centered programs and resources that are driven by learner needs and accessible to all students. So the development of academic skills, um, as we know, is a critical part of student success. And uh, through developing uh, effective learning skills and strategies to become self-regulated learners, students are able to identify and apply their strengths in the classroom, enabling both academic and personal growth as they work towards educational goals, which is an important element of thriving at university. So the programs and resources that we offer can help equip students with the tools that they need to be resilient and succeed, um, not only in university, but you know, beyond into the work environment and then in the broader community as you know, we hope they become um, engaged citizens afterwards. Um, and finally, acknowledging that navigating the university experience is a challenge. Uh, we aim to help students parse what supports and services they need and then make connections with the relevant uh, campus and peer supports that we have. So through our own uh, communication and programs, we focus on building relationships with students, uh, using their voices to inform our programming and promoting a welcoming and judgment-free contact point for all students to figure out what supports they need and then help them connect to those regardless of where they are located. Um, and as we've learned through the last two years, uh, making those connections can be even more difficult for students who are remote um, or not able to be physically on campus, whether they're an online student or a part-time student. Um, so we aim to be that sort of welcoming and responsive connection uh, for students to the campus community um, by ensuring our, our own services have virtual and asynchronous options, um, including peer support through the Peer Assisted Learning Program, which we're piloting um, in both an on-campus and online section in the coming semester. Uh, so moving on from the broad strokes of what we do at the ASC, um, here's what we've been actually up to. Um, so the winter 22 semester was our first real semester in operation with our three staff. And this provides a quick snapshot of what we've accomplished um, thus far. So first, a summary of student use of our 30 plus resources on our website, which has been visited um, at this point over 20,000 times since September. Um, our Learn is Success programming since January has included uh, 11 synchronous strategy sessions offered via WebEx, uh, some of which have been recorded to contribute to the 12 video resources on our website that students can access at any time. Um, and these live strategy sessions that Melissa has hosted have been attended by a total of 268 students over the course of the winter, um, with 41 of those students attending repeat sessions. And finally, again, as a little preview, um, we've been using this semester to plan for our peer assisted learning program, which is uh, ready to roll out next week, which will be offered in two course sections in the spring semester. Um, and we will be led by two students we have hired and are currently training as peer leaders. And I see a question in the chat, and I think that Melissa might address it, but we'll certainly save that uh, for the end as well. Uh, so after that quick look of what we've been doing, we'll take a look at uh, each of the services that we're offering and how they can be helpful and effective for students and for instructors and staff who support student success. So these are the three main categories of service that we offer, uh, which include acting as that academic service hub to provide the easy access to supports and services across the university, um, promoting learner success through those learning skills strategy sessions and resources, uh, and our peer assisted learning program, which offers a non-remedial academic support program that's integrated within historically challenging courses.
Um, and first I'll talk a little bit about the first uh, component of the service, which is the academic service hub. Um, and again, we know that there are many excellent supports and services available to students at Memorial, but it can be challenging for students to know what help is out there and how they can access it. Uh, so we aim to serve as that sort of one stop shop to help students connect with the supports that they need. So these tiles are some examples of the most visited areas of our website, uh, which include our own ASC resources, as well as links out to um, connect students with other service units. Uh, so for example, under learning support, students can find information available from um, offices like academic advising, accessibility services from the Blunden Center, uh, learning technology resources, including how to use Navigate to connect uh, with these supports. So our own learner success uh, programming can be found in there as well. So it, it makes it a pretty broad category that covers a lot of ground, but it does serve as that access point where students can find out what supports are on offer and hopefully build some awareness of uh, those services. The next two sections of the website have proven popular for students, uh, which we've noticed in traffic to the website, particularly during the remote semesters. Um, and those are the campus wide listings of study spaces and help centers. Uh, so under study spaces, students can quickly view the different types of spaces that are available from the Memorial Libraries and Commons, um, as well as the remote learning classrooms when those were relevant. Uh, so students can visit that one page to find complete listings, hours, booking links uh, for different locations to meet their needs while they are looking to study or, or learn remotely on campus. Uh, and similarly, the Help Center section provides a list of all of the academic unit help centers. Uh, which are an important resource for students to connect uh, with instructional staff and receive uh, that kind of just in time um, and instructional support. And again, that provides that single access point for students to find out what help centers we have, how they can avail of the kind of support from those resources like the Math Help Center, the Physics Help Center, the Writing Center, um, and so on, saving them time and making it easy for for students to see what help is there in the different subject areas without having to navigate um, across many different departmental sites. So overall recognizing that it can be difficult for students to identify where they need to go for the different kinds of academic supports at such a large institution. Um, we encourage students to use our website as uh, that resource to see what's available and we welcome them to contact us at succeed at mun.ca. Um, with questions or for assistance with navigating um, any of those resources. So uh, with that, I will pass it over to Melissa, who will tell us a little bit more in depth um, about the learner success programming. Perfect. Thanks, Alicia. So as a learner success specialist at the ASC, my goal has been to look at promoting a growth culture among students to become independent, engaged, and strategic learners who are better able to reach their academic goals. Throughout the last semester, the Learning Skills Hub has been serving a dual purpose as both a launching point and a landing point for students as they navigate their academic journeys. From this philosophy, we've established an online repository, an Evolve Encounter events, and a pathway for customized requests. Our programming has reached students across all programs, all years, and around the world. To unpack how the Learning Skills Hub has been utilized this semester, I'm going to dive into each of these areas and explore them a bit deeper. When we launched Learning Skills Hub, we began with a foundational suite of resources focused on enhancing students' learning skills and study skills. A repository of asynchronous web-based resources has blossomed over the last five months and now covers a wide variety of academic focused topics. Our resources are designed to support students beginning from their very first day of their course opening, following them throughout the entire semester experiencing, targeting everything from reading and study strategies to assignment help and, of course, test prep and exam performance strategies, and we even push past the traditional semester and end by offering resources for students to use after they receive their final grades. In total, as Alicia mentioned, our repository currently boasts in excess of 30 plus resources for students. Now, a repository can only be as impactful as its reach allows it to be. So to this end, regardless of if students are in Marystown or Mumbai, they can access all of our online resources 24-7 whether they're in the leisure of their own home, hungered down into one of those study spaces on campus, or logging in between classes. Our resources are purposely not hidden behind a paywall. 
they're not a registered first platform, and they're not housed within a non-credit course requiring some form of acceptance. Our resources are posted publicly through the MUN.ca website to promote access by allowing each and every student the opportunity to opt in at any moment without any added costs or approvals and access exactly what they need, when they need it, and as many times as they need it. In regards to faculty and staff, our resources are also openly available to be shared by you amongst your students at any time that you see the opportunity for it. Our resources are simply always available. The resources hub itself will continually expand and evolve as I continue to receive feedback from students, faculty, and staff as we assess shifts in the learning climate and as we explore value-added learning opportunities. To complement the online resources we offer students, we have the opportunity for dynamic live interactions through a series of hosted events throughout the semester, even during the spring and summer semesters. To reinforce the idea of the independent, engaged, and strategic learner, these needs-driven events have been promoted to students as strategy sessions. My live events, which have been a true lightning in the ball sensation, have attracted hundreds of students and further increased avenues for student engagement. Again, as we do believe in equitable access for all students as much as possible, every live stream session is recorded and later posted on our website as an embedded YouTube video. This allows students the opportunity to access the information when it serves them the best. This also allows students to elect to opt in when they have, may have less time-based conflicts, when they may have less interrupted bandwidth or better access to bandwidth, or when they will be able to have just less distractions overall. Again, meeting our overarching goal of providing students with that just-in-time resource. Selecting which topics to present first became really my next consideration. We researched the university student life cycle that was developed here in Canada and perused dozens upon dozens of success centers' own online presences. It was important to us to focus not only on what was on other centers' websites and repositories, but also when within their semester they were promoting it. We then scaled that down to the local level by meeting with several key frontline resource centers right here at MUN to discuss what concerns they may have for areas where students were being underserved, were underskilled, or possibly were undertrained. Through all of this, we felt well informed to craft our first four <laughs> strategy sessions, which we used to promote our center, our services, and draw on students. Once we had hit the ground running with these, we were able to pull in another large missing piece of our puzzle, the MUN students themselves. I used our strategy session discussion forums to foster dialogue around what issues students were facing or anticipating that was causing a gap to grow between the academic success they wanted and the one they were currently experiencing. I also circulated quick feedback surveys after every session to promote student voice within the program planning itself. And I did this fairly unabashedly, going so far as to title one of them, Valuing Your Voice, and Your Voice Matters. When students are reminded that they are important to our process and that their voices are valuable, the relationship becomes more reciprocal and they begin to buy in. The question then emerges, why have we chosen to brand them as strategy sessions and not strategy workshops? A considered effort was made to package our events in a way that would connect with the students and offer them as a tool, something that is actionable, something they can put to work. And strategies are that something. By marketing events to students as strategies, they can be regarded as an addition to the student's skills versus a deficiency needing to be addressed. Pushing that these events are fully devoid of any connection to being a remedial offering or requirement. <clears throat> During our initial discussions with frontline student resource centers, there was dialogue of how skill development workshops can come with a stigma that the only students expected to come or welcome to come are ones who are definitely on a path to failing out. However, in stark contrast to such skill development workshops, our strategy sessions and resources have drawn an audience who is not always the classic perceived archetype of the struggling student, cursed by low grades and low attendance. We have had students who are top of their class, high achievers, mature students, fresh from high school students, international or domestic students, undergrad, and even postgrad. We're truly applicable to any type of MUN student you can imagine. People are interested in the idea of becoming more efficient and more effective at something. And that idea simply connects with every student here at MUN. What then has been the foci of our strategy sessions? Much like our repository spanning a full semester, our strategy sessions also span from first day right through to receiving final grades. We have discussed designing student success strategies, 
deciphering your syllabus, critical reading strategies, procrastination blasting, presentations like a pro, communicating with your professor, common test taking strategies, preparing for exams and designing an exam study plan, and post-exam debriefing. With all of these events, the question arises, how do we actually draw in the students? So valuing the student experience as a real world lived experience that's personal and important has been key to how we reach out to the students to draw them in. For promotion of each session, we evoke an engaging question or prompt tied to a possible emotion that they're experiencing. This process also normalizes those emotions in a time when students could otherwise feel quite isolated by it. We then offer a skill or tool that students can adopt in their own practice to begin addressing the root academic issue connected to that emotion. For example, during the deciphering your syllabus session, we collectively explore the world of Bloom's taxonomy and the language that is used in developing learning outcomes. Now, marketing our sessions as Bloom's Taxonomy 101, I think we can all agree would have been unlikely to have anyone register. However, we pitched it as deciphering your syllabus. And that brought up an emotion of feeling lost and confused. And most students find syllabi, even very well-crafted ones, confusing and mysterious when they first encounter them. By saying we will help them decipher it, we acknowledge those emotions and shifted them into the problem-solving mode. Blooms just happens to be the tool that I taught, and I saw over 100 students tap into that problem, that emotion, and that strategy. What worked for me for these events was essentially breaking down that stigma or that shame that can create a feeling of isolation for students. Then replacing that with a sense of communal experience, a sense of belonging, and the skills, tools, and tech that can help them regain control and management of navigating their academic pathway. So what then is the process for success I've used for attaining our high levels of attendance? So through a carefully crafted approach built on 21st century principles and supported through technology, I was able to develop an offering of live events that attracted hundreds of students this semester, in addition to the thousands upon thousands of website views that Alicia had mentioned. So step one, we discussed already, which was pitching the strategy session in a digestible way for students and timed intuitively around a needs-driven schedule, delivering the tools they can use right away. So by offering a session called Deciphering Your Syllabus in the middle of week one, we hooked them and we got them early into what we're doing. Another example is that we have taught something called bounce back strategies, and we release this and promote it uh, around any major set of marks that come back. Step two has been timing a session for highest impact. I researched what day of the week and what time in the day is optimal for being able to get someone's attention, but didn't ask for too much of their scarce free time. And this was done by using TED Talks and YouTube videos as my blueprint, both of which lend themselves to a format of roughly 15 minutes. So for each session I prepare, it works out to about 15 minutes of presented material for me, followed by 30 minutes of discussion forum for them. And what the time period communicates is a few things. So first, 45 minutes just simply sounds a lot more consumable than one hour. 45 minutes is about the length of a long Netflix episode. Second, by having a third dedicated to me and two thirds dedicated to them, it says, you're the important piece here. This is your time, your platform, and I'm here to help you. As one student remarked, they also greatly appreciated the sessions were short enough and live streamed because they could tune in while walking across campus trying to get between classes versus an in-person session, which wasn't live streamed, which they simply would never have been able to arrange into their schedule. Step three was communicating to students about the sessions. And here I quickly made use of one of the most heavily advertised apps around campus, the MUN Navigate app. This app is a brilliant tool and knowing from student feedback that students prefer direct contact through emails, we utilize the Navigate app to generate an email that could go out en masse directly to each student's inbox. The email subject line would state, you're invited to XYZ. And the body had a short four to five sentence blurb to hook them. Again, this is where we would carefully target a potentially otherwise isolating emotion and spotlight the commonality of it, such as, is your semester feeling chaotic and you can't keep up with your deadlines? Another bonus of Navigate is that while using the desktop version of it to generate and send the email, it'll appear as if it comes from my direct inbox. This further humanizes and personalizes that experience for them. If students do reply email, it does actually go, fact, uh, go into my email and it creates that direct link between us. Step four, again, no shock here, is communication and creating a sense of belonging. This time we're looking at the Q&A. 
and after the after session dialogue with students. During the Q&A, they can use the message feature in the chat. They can mic or video in, or they can also choose to send in questions ahead of time. Sending in questions ahead of time before the session ever begins also gives them anonymity, which really translates to openness and honesty in their inquiries, which we may otherwise not have heard or they may not have wanted to voice. I'll read that question out loud and offer up recommendations that they can investigate resources they should check out or referrals to centers here on campus that can better help them with that particular problem. Students have also used the Q&A to build off one another's questions or second a statement that someone else has made. They're joining in together in a way that wouldn't have been possible during uh, remote periods, wouldn't, sorry, wouldn't have otherwise been possible during remote periods. Or if you consider that we have an attendance in one session, we'll have students here in town, students in Grenfell and students overseas all at once. It can be a community connecting experience that wouldn't have been possible without the technology that we use through WebEx and without that platform for them all to meet. And all of this occurs in just 30 minutes of the strategy session that is blocked up for them and them only as the Q&A. But to fully practice what we preach about being reflective, accepting feedback and growing, after each session, I do circulate a short survey asking about any questions they have following the session, any inspiration or recommendations for future sessions, and just some generalized feedback. To summarize, the success of the strategy sessions has come from being student-centered, creating a commonality around their real world problems they're experiencing that's impacting their academic goals and using MUN supportive technology to maximize our reach and our impact. You may not be wondering how to utilize the ASC's learning skills hub into your own practice. Our efforts for supporting students extends into the classroom as well. All of our online resources can be modified or condensed down to be applicable to your in-class requirements. Further, if there is an academic learning skill or study skill, which you note as needing improvement amongst your students, but hasn't yet been developed into a resource that we have online, this too is something that we as a team at the ASC could certainly assist with. For example, we could modify our presentations like a pro strategy session to be condensed down from an all encompassing resource into one modified to be for single presenters delivering through video chat. Or we can also look at packaging a few resources together to offer students who are about to embark on a large group uh, project with an in-person presentation at the semester end to have one deliverable that hits all of those points of working in a group and delivering online. Professors may also be interested in embedding our website directly into their syllabi or optionally, even as a sub-module on Brightspace. Our assistance to you can extend beyond assignment or testing assistance. We can also be linked as a recommended source to connect your students to resources aimed at developing strong classroom skills such as note taking or course reading, or even connecting them to what we have put together for communication <clears throat> expectations of professionally emailing a professor and how to book office hours. This embedded outreach can be a minor change that can make a dramatic impact on your students. And it is available to you at any time by reaching out to us at succeed at mun.ca. As a perpetual believer in having the collective voice be heard and be involved, uh, Alicia is moderating a question we have for faculty and staff. In your experience, what learning skills do students struggle with the most? So please feel free to take a few minutes to submit your anon anonymous reply or replies using the link that she has posted in the chat or what is on your screen. So I see a lot of these are related to time management, keeping up, organizing their time. So some commonalities, I think all of these are pretty much related to time management, which is not a surprise. 
confidence, problem solving. Melissa, I don't know if you want to comment on some of our uh, existing resources around time management. Yes, yeah, so on our website, we would have a printable resource for students as well as a web page uh, skill development section and a video recording all based around time management of planning your semester. There's also procrastination blasting in there, uh, SMART goals. So we have a whole hub within our hub of time management skills. So uh, definitely if there's something you see that could uh, be directing them towards there, it's uh, we've got stuff to help. Uh, and again, like Melissa mentioned, uh, you know, we've been tapping into the student voice, but recognizing that the instructors have a different view um, and could identify some areas that students may not be aware of um, or not able to articulate, um, you know, reflecting on their own experiences and challenges. And I think some of those, uh, the uh, responses that we've received might uh, reflect that, like in confidence, students may not necessarily identify that they're not confident in their skills. Um, but as instructors, you are able to see that um, in your classes. So leave that open for another moment. I think there's still. So I will stop sharing my screen, but we'll leave that Mentimeter open for the rest of the session. And thanks to those who submitted some responses. And again, these are, you know, valuable for us to get that perspective and help us guide some of the resources as we continue to build out um, some programming um, and strategy sessions like Melissa uh, mentioned. So thanks, Melissa, for that summary of uh, the success that we've had in learner success programming. Um, and looking ahead, uh, we're excited for the future of the Academic Success Center um, as we do plan to continue to grow those learner success supports um, that address student needs and build on that engagement that we've seen from students so far and expanding on the work that Melissa uh, has done as we continue to hope to support students across every stage of their academic journey. Um, as we're growing along with them at this point um, as well. Um, and as part of that, we're looking to increase that collaboration with partners to help improve uh, the academic experiences of our students and contribute to the university's goal of student success uh, through the work with customized offerings, like Melissa had mentioned, to kind of target to particular, particular disciplines, courses, or, or student groups, um, and working with those other units and departments to provide students with uh, the most effective and kind of holistic and integrated uh, support experience. And finally, again, uh, we've kind of mentioned this uh, throughout because it's top of mind as we're launching it next week, um, but we are excited about the peer assisted learning program um, and piloting that this spring semester and then hopefully building upon it to expand offerings in future semesters. Uh, so that program brings a new opportunity for peer learning to the broader St. John's campus. Uh, so to finish our session this morning, uh, we wanted to share a spotlight on that um, and how its unique model benefits students and their academic success. So I will pass it along to Stephanie to share that with us. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to our talk today. And as Alicia mentioned earlier, my name is Stephanie Dowie and I'm the supplemental instruction supervisor. We're starting our pilot program in the spring semester, and I'm excited to tell you guys about it. So, first of all, what is peer assisted learning? Peer assisted learning, or PAL, is an internationally recognized academic support program. It's based on a model called supplemental instruction, or SI, and there are programs based on that same model already being offered at Grenfell campus and in Munn's engineering department. So, we want to expand on that success and bring it to the wider campus audience. The program itself has a rich history going back almost 50 years. Supplemental instruction was developed by Dr. Deanna Martin in 1973 at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, or UMKC. This model was so successful that an international center for supplemental instruction was created at UMKC. This international center has trained faculty and staff from 1,500 institutions worldwide, representing 32 different countries, such as Sweden, South Africa, Australia, and Egypt. Nowadays, we have our own national center at the University of Guelph. 
and the goal of PAL is to increase student academic success and retention. It does this by integrating what to learn with how to learn, meaning that it combines studying material with learning new study skills and strategies. So students will focus on what to learn, the course content in the sessions, and in participating in those sessions, they'll also gain new skills on how to learn that will help them retain the information and use those skills going forward. The program is based around peer facilitated group study sessions. These study sessions will be led by a trained PAL leader twice a week. They are regularly scheduled and on the first day of class, a PAL leader will distribute a survey to students regarding their availability. This allows us to work with the students day to day schedule and find the time most likely to have the highest rate of participation. As well, attendance is voluntary and sessions are outside of class times. Historically, PAL is an in-person program, but it can also be successfully facilitated as a remote or virtual program, as is being done at universities and colleges throughout the world. For our pilot program, we'll be working with an on-campus course and an online course, which gives us the opportunity to be an in-person service and also have a virtual presence. In addition, the program is non-remedial, meaning it's aimed at all students. There could be a student who's in danger of failing a course and wants a passing grade, or there could be an A student who wants to be an A plus student. PAL is there for everyone. Generally, the program is implemented in high risk courses. Classes are assessed as high risk based on the rates of DFWs, meaning grades of D, grades of F, and withdrawals from the course. When there are higher rates of DFWs, it signals that the material of the course is historically challenging, which means students are having ongoing difficulty learning the material. And that's where we come in. With PAL sessions, students become more familiar with course content by working together on activities created by the PAL leader. So with this well-established model and history of widespread success, PAL is very much an evidence-based program, and the Academic Success Center is following the best practices put forward by the national and international centers. As I mentioned, these study sessions will be facilitated by a trained student leader. This leader will use learning strategies and collaborative techniques taught through training to ensure peer-to-peer -peer interaction. We'll also develop these skills throughout the term in ongoing workshops. The leaders are near peers, meaning that they are undergraduate students that are a little bit ahead of the students they would be helping. They have already completed the course in which PAL is being offered and received a high grade. Preferably, they also completed the course with the same instructor that they'll be working with as a leader, and that would help us in the next factor, which is that the PAL leader preferably comes with a faculty recommendation. So we'd be looking for a faculty input on somebody who did well in their course in the past or who they think would be a good fit for this role. In addition, the leader would attend class lectures for the course they're helping with, but they won't participate in class discussions or answer questions unless called upon, which ensures that the students get first say. The leader specifically does not reteach or re-lecture. PAL is a program that is complementary to lectures and other assistive programs like help centers. The leader does not tutor or help with homework or assignments from the course. Instead, they'll come up with session plans that review more challenging course concepts in different ways that will engage the class. To make the learning interactive, the leader will facilitate activities or games. This could be something like an informal quiz, a game of Jeopardy, or working through practice problems together. Obviously, there are a lot of benefits for students and faculty alike. Students can earn higher subject grades while they learn effective study skills. As well, PAL provides an opportunity for students to develop relationships with peers and faculty, which is an important factor in retention and in creating a sense of unity. Students who participate in PAL also tend to participate more in class. So maybe they've gained some confidence in their knowledge or in their own abilities, and now they feel more comfortable speaking up in class. In addition, strategies used in PAL sessions can also be adopted during regular class times. Students can learn different skills like active listening and note taking techniques, which can be used in this particular course or in other courses going forward. Now I have a couple of quotes showing the effectiveness of the program. The International Center for Supplemental Instruction at UMKC reports that students who regularly attend PAL sessions for their classes earn on average half to a full letter grade higher than students who don't. So certainly there can be some significant academic benefit. Another article found that students who study in groups learn two and a half times more than students who study alone if the groups stay on task. So there can be much more retention of information in a group session, and it's the PAL leader's job to keep that group session on track. 
In reflecting on the major themes of this conference, PAL plays an important role in teaching for change. The PAL program equips students to shape their futures by teaching them learning strategies and study skills. This then creates independent learners while still offering an enriching and collaborative environment. PAL also teaches students new ways to connect with classmates and the course material, encourages collaborative and independent learning, and focuses on active learning experience. This new way of learning through PAL participation can allow a deeper understanding and a higher rate of recall for course material. Moreover, PAL enables students to feel a sense of belonging with their classmates as they take part in peer learning in a welcoming environment. Students will make connections with each other and with their peer leaders. Additionally, peer leaders will form relationships and bonds with each other, as well as connect senior leaders who mentor new leaders. PAL also helps students explore their opportunities and find their place. This process is aided by better understanding of course content, which should help the student decide exactly where they belong at MUN and what program they want to pursue. Finally, PAL introduces a new active learning practice outside of the classroom. This achieves higher learning outcomes and enhances the student experience independently, socially, and academically. In terms of independence, PAL creates independent learners who gain skills in studying and note-taking, among other areas. Additionally, PAL encourages peers to interact and ask questions in a space where no authority figures are present, which allows further social development with classmates. And of course, academically, grades increase with better understanding of course material. Also, technology plays a role in our program. Throughout the world, due in large part to the shifting needs of students during the pandemic, SI, Supplemental Instruction, which is the model that PAL is based on, went from being in-person sessions to now also offering virtual sessions. So technology has played a big role in expanding the program and meeting student needs. These virtual sessions offer students increased availability and flexibility in terms of scheduling and let students participate regardless of location or on-campus presence. Lastly, online PAL sessions allow the PAL leaders the opportunity of creating a learning environment specific to the online student. This can enhance the academic and social experience of university students who can't meet their classmates in person. They, can, they get an opportunity to interact in a live setting, asking questions about course content and making connections with peers. To conclude, there are so many opportunities for students to succeed in this program and we're very excited for our launch. Thank you so much for taking the time today to learn about PAL and now it's back to Alicia to wrap things up. I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> So to wrap up, this kind of provides uh, a quick overview of what we discussed um, and how the ASC can be helpful um, and beneficial for students as well as instructors and staff, whether that's uh, looking like for instructors, uh, referrals to us to help connect with academic supports, uh, directing students to the library of resources that we have, the option of customized uh, workshops or resources or participation in the peer assisted learning program, um, which we do encourage any instructors who are interested uh, in more information um, or in, in participating in the program to certainly um, reach out to us. So that brings us to the end. Uh, we've included our general email here as well as again our website address um, as well as our own contact information if uh, anybody's looking for more information or has any follow-up questions but we'll take some time for questions. I see that there's been a few in the chat uh, throughout the session. Thank you all very much. That was very informative. Uh, I'll just scroll back. I had copied a couple of the questions down, so I'll just uh, read those out and you can decide uh, who wants to respond. The first question, Alicia, you had noted that um, somebody had asked about the strategy piece. So I don't know if anybody wanted to elaborate on that a little bit more. That was kind of early in the session. Sure, I think that was before we got to Melissa's section, but Melissa, if you wanted to add anything else about uh, like the strategy aspect of learner success? Uh, yeah, so with calling it um, a strategy a session, essentially, we're moving away from the, the notion of a workshop, moving away from kind of the idea of a course that students are forced into uh, to like up their grades. So the strategy part of it is uh, making it not just a, a tool that they can use, a thing they can put to action right away, like strategies have more of an active presence to them where workshops can feel a little bit more passive. But it also just uh, makes it that it's something going into their toolkit 
and not a remedial. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, how does one become a peer assisted course? And this person had noted that at UMB Fredericton, uh, they offer this and it was very worthwhile. So how does one become peer assistant? Stephanie, I don't know if you want to speak to that one. Sure, yes, I'm glad to hear that somebody has uh, has some familiarity with the PAL program and that it's been useful at other universities. Uh, to become a peer assisted course, you can certainly reach out to me or reach out to Alicia or the Academic Success Center email address in general, and we'd certainly discuss with you. I see somebody in the chat has uh, is interested in a chat next week, and we are absolutely available for that. <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to give me your email address or reach out to us at one of the email addresses provided, that would be great. And the courses that we are piloting in the spring are math courses. Um, and John, I believe that those that's your area as well. So that would be um, helpful for us as we are looking to expand. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, what information does the ASC or anyone else have about whether the strategy sessions and other scheduled offerings are drawing in students, but also drawing them away from attending their classes? So I noted earlier that um, most of the classes for, or sorry, most of the sessions for PAL works around the student schedule, so they wouldn't conflict and they would be outside of class time. But the other sessions, are they offered during class time? And this person was just asking, um, is there any way to work with the registrar's office to actually reserve time? Many of the schools and faculties have departmental meetings, so they don't schedule classes during that time. So is that something taken into consideration when, when planning the, the times that the sessions would happen? Uh, so for the uh, drawing students away from class, so a couple things about that one. So one of the things with our sessions, <laughs> anecdotally, uh, I've been emailed by students quite often saying, I can't make this session. Will it be recorded? Or I can't make it at three o'clock. So it's Wednesdays at three is when we offered them this past semester. Uh, they would say, I can't make it at three. I, my class goes till three thirty, and I would say that's fine. The perk of the presentation part of it being only seven to fifteen minutes, depending on what that week's session is, is that if they show up at three thirty, three forty-five, I can run it again pretty quickly for them, which I I have done throughout the semester. So, I I don't believe we've had a lot of students opt to attend our session and not go to a class because everything that we present or discuss is made available uh, very rapidly so the resources uh, the slides are up within the day and then the recording is usually there within 24 hours for most of the students so they they're not waiting weeks to get access to that material and they know from the email i send that if they can't make it the stuff will be online so there's no push for them to find out after having cut a class that they didn't have to cut the class so we we definitely aren't looking for them to cut the class to attend ours and uh, the feedback that we've had kind of indicates that they're letting us know they want the stuff because they're going to go to class instead. Uh, for picking a time overall, uh, we've had insight from uh, some of the other student supports who've put off learning skill workshops in the past of when in the week didn't work for them. Uh, so like Mondays at 8 a.m. are just not gonna connect or times that are too highly booked because there were a lot of classes. So we have avoided those when we were initially looking. And we also looked into when students in general were most receptive and Wednesdays was about that time, the afternoon was about that time. So we have picked Wednesday afternoons to trial it this semester during our pilot, like I said, at three o'clock. Now, as we gain more momentum and repute and data, we can look to analyze if there's a better practice of time, but one that is also mindful of what we're looking to do, which is be all inclusive. So we're looking at St. John's, Grenfell, Labrador, and online learning communities. So finding a, a perfect time is probably unlikely, but we will continue to like be referring to that time and seeing if there's a better uh, offering for it. So always room to grow, always room to, to reflect, but so far it's been working pretty well and, and we'll just keep looking to see that it keeps working well. Thank you. Are there any sessions offered on confidence? Oh, I think that's me again. Um, so <laughs> we integrate into our sessions and resources confidence targeting developments, I would say. So within them, we look to promote things such as praising and acknowledging accomplishments the students has. So we would say, for example, a mark of 75 in a class, we tell the students like that 75 is what it is to you. So if you've been a 40 student, a 75 is something to accomplish. 
So, you know, acknowledge the work that you've put into this, praise yourself for the work that went into this. We also tell them to create realistic expectations. So we look at SMART goals, we look at, you know, what uh, study strategies or learning strategies have you used to kind of get them to predict a grade that they think actually reflects that. Um, throughout all of them are embracing a growth mindset and increasing their sense of ownership over it. And we tell them to not compare students amongst each other. So when you leave your test, go to our post-test assessment, our post-test debrief. Don't start talking to other students right away and saying like, how'd you do, how'd I do? And same with marks. So I'd say the sessions where we most specifically target all of those or most of those would be in our bounce back programming, uh, which again, we release around high mark uh, times. So when they're gonna get the most of their marks back, those are connected to really high dropout times or low self-confidence times. And uh, our examine grade debrief, which challenges students to look at what they did to get into the position they are for their exam and then reflect back on it afterwards to see how that kind of worked out for them. So we're trying to build up confidence by building up their skills, but also making them be aware that, you know, they're putting in hard work and there's a growth that goes into using new strategies and new skills and really tracking how that worked out for them. Thank you. Uh, next question, Melissa, I think we'll give you a break and uh, Stephanie, maybe if you want to take this one. Um, how does PAL deal with clashing study cultures as offered to all students? So I don't know if you've come across that, dealing with students uh, who have different study cultures and how they deal with that in the PAL program. Well, we are doing our pilot program next term, so I certainly think that's something we can develop more. Uh, certainly students have a lot of different methods and styles of learning. Different things work for different students and schedules are all different as well. And we'd be working on those different styles, styles in a variety of skills through participation and engagement in different activities and sessions. So we'd be working towards really engaging and developing an independent learner. And through the different activities and games that are offered, I think we can reach a variety of different study cultures. And we'd also be doing ongoing development workshops with PAL leaders throughout the term. So we'd be getting feedback from students and from the leaders and any issues that they think we can work on, then we would work on that throughout our workshops during the term. And I'll just add to that too, is that I think that might be a benefit of the PAL program in that students are you know, experiencing how other people study and learn and, you know, maybe reflect on um, that and be able to kind of access the different perspectives of their peers. And, uh, you know, I think that kind of peer sharing aspect of it um, is an important kind of learning experience in itself, being exposed to different types and methods of learning. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, somebody had asked if Grenfell students can avail of these supports, and I think you've alluded to that, that you do have students from Grenfell accessing supports. And in terms of the PAL program, I think you mentioned there may be a similar peer support program offered at Grenfell. Yes, there is a supplementary instruction program offered at Grenfell. We are specific to the St. John's campus right now, but uh, there is a program also offered at Grenfell. Yeah, and the Grenfell does have the Learning Center. So while our workshops and strategy sessions and all of, obviously everything posted on our website is available to all students, um, regardless of what campus they're on. But um, yeah, the Learning Center does serve Grenfell students in particular, um, but we certainly welcome them to join us um, for any of those programs. Excellent, and I can see some more chat there. I think um, if you can jot down some of those email addresses, I think there's going to be some connections with uh, further discussions after the session, which is great. Uh, we're just coming up on the hour, so uh, I'm just going to wrap up. I know people are probably going to get to other sessions. So again, thank you very much to our presenters and to all of you for attending this session.